I am Brad Keeler. He is Tim Stark. Find out on Director's Cut next how he used his extensive disaster knowledge in a tropical paradise. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I am the director of the Geo Institute. That is why we call the show Director's Cut. Every week, I sit down with a different GI member who tells us loads of information about themselves, their personal life, their professional life, everything about it is fun. If you like what you are about to see, and I think you will, click on the little button that says subscribe, then you want to click the bell to get notifications, and we will let you know in a very loving, polite way every time we post a video to the YouTube channel, which is frequently. This week, I am thrilled to be joined by my guest who is coming to us live from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he is a faculty member. It is Tim Stark. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Director's Cut. That is it. This is our 25th episode, I believe. So it's some kind of milestone, maybe. I, I don't know. I wish I wish there were a cake, but I fear there is not. <laughs> so we will start Director's Cut with Tim the same way we start with everyone else. Describe your job in 45 seconds. Oh, teaching, research, professional service, a little bit of consulting, and... Um, Writing a lot of papers. I think that is the most concise answer we have had so <laughs> far. Yet it perfectly encapsulated everything you do in a day. That was excellent. So we move right into the fun questions, which of course, if I would think this is what it's all about for you Director's Cut viewers. Tim, what event signals to you the start of spring every year? I open my weather app on my phone I go to extended forecast and it's all 40s. All the highs are in the 40s. I know it's Illinois, but so no longer 10, 0, 20, all 40s. I want to thank you for clarifying that that's the highs that you're looking at in the <laughs> 40s. Because I think for us, and we're in the DC area, which is not exactly tropical. Um, I look for lows above 50, and then I feel like oh. we've we've hit springtime. That's when you can start moving the plants out and stuff. Now, I do have to ask a follow-up question. What weather app do you use, and what do you love about it? Uh, I use two. Uh, one is the weather app built onto the iPhone, and the other is Yahoo Weather. And Yahoo Weather is a little more detailed, but uh, the weather app built into the iPhone is pretty quick. And so usually I just pop that open, look at the extended temperatures and see whether I'm in spring or not. That is excellent. You've never converted to weather bug. Have you ever used weather bug? Nope. Go check it out. You will love it. Maybe after the interview, but uh, yeah. Now we're going to go back. We ask people to think about their past a lot on Director's Cut. And the first question that I will make you reflect on is that you moved from Berkeley to Virginia Tech with Mike Duncan during your graduate studies. What went into that decision and what was challenging about it? <laughs> um, nothing on my side went into that decision. <laughs> uh, I was at Berkeley. I passed my Ph.D. exam, which is... Well, back then it was a week long. You picked up the exam, I think it was a Monday, and you brought it back the following Monday, and you were locked down on that exam for a week. So it was a significant event. And so I passed that, started my PhD research with Mike Duncan, and he, I got a message, come, come go see Professor Duncan. And so I went and saw him, and he sort of dropped the news on me that, oh, uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to move to Virginia Tech this summer, which was uh, 1984. 
and uh, he said, boy, it'd be great if you wanted to go. And I said, well, where? <laughs> and at that time, it wasn't called Virginia Tech. It was Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, VP, VPI and SU. And they were just transitioning to Virginia Tech. And now, of course, it's Virginia Tech. And of course, I had never heard of the school at that point. And, and I asked, you know, where is it located? Blacksburg, Virginia. Oh, boy. Hadn't heard of Blacksburg either. So I said, OK, uh, I'll, I'll do some research. And of course, uh, I wanted to stay in the Berkeley area, San Francisco, of course. And I talked with the late Professor Seed, that's H. Bolton Seed, and I had an interest in liquefaction and still do. And he said, well, if you want a PhD, you need to move with Mike. So uh, he, Professor Seed, very distinguished British gentleman, uh, was sitting in his office. He had a little round table. And uh, when he if you want a PhD, you need to move. That, that was that was that. So you packed the bags. What was the most exciting cultural aspect of moving to Blacksburg for you in the mid '80s? I can only imagine what it must have been like. Well, Mike, Mike helped me move, and the biggest thing, uh, or maybe the most important thing, I had to move was my motorcycle. <laughs> So uh, I drove it over to Mike's house and all the other stuff I had and put it, he just put it on his moving truck and drove my car over to Blacksburg and met him, met him in Blacksburg. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. <laughs> so we go from that back to one of the fun ones. I don't know if this is going to be a quick one or not, because a lot of people are passionate about the stuff they drink. What is your daily beverage of choice, either at the office or at home? Coffee, tea, Mountain Dew, something else? What do you go to? <laughs> Primarily iced water and then, depending on the day, uh, iced tea, unsweetened iced tea. And you've never, you, you can't do sweet tea or you just choose not to? Can't, don't, don't like sweet tea. Just, I don't know. Do you make it yourself or is this a store-bought uh, tea? Store-bought. You got to try the sun tea. Have you tried sun tea? No, sun you gotta tea. You got to do it with the bags and put it on the porch. Oh, oh yeah. Make it just, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, usually pure leaf or um, what's it? Golden, golden Gold Peak. Gold Peak. Yeah. Oh, those are solid choices. So we know if anybody has to bribe you, that's that's where they go is the iced tea. <laughs> yeah, iced tea. I guess. <laughs> so one one interesting thing you got to do, and we said it in the intro to the show, is that you got to consult for the World Bank on post-hurricane issues in St. Martin, a tropical paradise. What was that like? How long were you there? What was the work like? What did you enjoy? What what did you not enjoy? I guess it could be any or all of those things. Oh, great. Now, this will not be a one-word answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, myself and Todd Thalhammer, uh, an expert also, also on elevated temperatures and landfills, we traveled there spent uh, three days on the trip. And the big problem was there was just an enormous amount of debris from the two hurricanes, er, mainly Irma. And they created a Irma disposal facility across the street from their traditional disposal facility. Well, at the time, they were both on fire. So we, we arrived and both on fire and how, what do we do and how, how can we get it under control? But it led to some really interesting work on elevated temperatures and landfills and what the temperatures actually are in the facility. What is the mechanism? Is it combustion? Is it pyrolysis? Is it 
some strange bacterial reaction, what, what's actually going on. And so we were able to investigate that pretty carefully with both of them on fire, obviously two different sources of waste. The Irma pile was everything you can imagine from boats to metal to buildings, to concrete, everything. And um, in the MSW facility, uh, a range of things as well, but both, both experiencing combustion. And so that led to the paper I'll present in the GeoExtreme 2021 conference that's coming up that I hope we'll get to talk about sometime today. Now, you ask me, what else did we do? So St. Martin, that was my first trip there. Really just a beautiful spot, incredible, just incredible. And so after spending the day trying to figure out what to do with the facilities, uh, one with extremely steep slopes, right, overlooking a neighborhood and, and it also combusting at the same time. Let's see, one day we zip lined. So it was one of the longest zip line stretches from the top of the mountain on the island all the way down to the bottom, um, speed of about 60 miles, 55, 60 miles per hour. <laughs> that was really great. And there are a couple other zip lines up there. So that was one day. The next day, jet skiing in the beautiful Caribbean. Oh my goodness, just beautiful. And uh, the water was just great in terms of warm let's see we were there in august yeah oh it's just great beautiful blue so it was definitely above the 40s in your weather app oh absolutely <laughs> i didn't need to check the weather app <laughs> that's true oh no rain beautiful was there anything different about being there and working under the world bank or funded by the world bank than you would have done otherwise no, there were, let's see, two, at least two, three representatives from the World Bank with us and a number of other consultants working on the hurricane aftermath in the island. And there was a lot of problems. I mean, you drive down the street, there are just boats, you know, on the sidewalk, just off the street, pushed off to the side, uh, trees just knocked over everywhere and most of the hills just bare uh, so there was a lot going on and a uh, number of consultants private consultants as well and at least three world bank then we met with some of the leaders of the island one night they meet for cigars in the evenings <laughs> that was that was really interesting so little bit different than a New England town council meeting or something like that. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> and there's a uh, rum made on the island, so there, there's a lot, a lot of uh, really good rum. So. And Tim did <clears throat> mention the Geo Extreme Conference, and we will talk about that in a little bit. Right now, I have to ask you the second question that we ask every single person that's on Director's Cut. How did you first get involved with ASCE and GI? That goes all the way back to my undergraduate days at the University of Delaware. So I was involved as a junior and then uh, got encouraged to run for president of the student chapter and was elected and just had a great time with that we the year before my junior year we built a concrete barge that was supposed to be a concrete canoe and it didn't float and so i said that we should try something else and got involved with a community project so this is like 1980 81 or 80 and um, helped the local museum with a lot of civil engineering things, building a bridge for them, foundation for their petrified log. And so that was one of the early community projects of a ASCE student chapter. And, and there's an article in a civil engineering magazine in about 1982 describing the project. 
And so ever since that, I've just stayed involved with ASCE. And then with GI, obviously it was a little bit later because GI didn't exist in 1980. <laughs> but eventually you were chair of the Embankments, Dams and Slopes Committee. Any Anything else in your involvement in GI that really stands out over the years? Yeah, so before it became the GI, it was the Soil Mechanics and Engineering. Oh, I guess it was the Geotechnical Engineering Division. Looking at my wall. So as the news correspondent for the Geotechnical Engineering Division way back, you know, when you're an assistant professor, hey, do you want to be the news correspondent? You say yes to everything. And so I, I received the News Correspondent Award in 1995. So that was like one of my first geotechnical engineering involvement before it was the GI, right after my PhD in sort of starting a faculty career. That is excellent. So we've got a few more questions here the rest of the way that are all unique. And again, some of them are fun ones, and we're going to hit you with one now. What is the most valuable thing you've ever owned that was <clears throat> thrown away, either by you or somebody you knew? Or I guess it could be thrown away by somebody you didn't know, but the most <laughs> valuable thing you've ever owned that was thrown away. Well, valuable, um, or how about favorite, uh, would be my old Schwinn Typhoon two-speed bike. Oh, it was just great, and I remember it was... I left it at my parents' house in Delaware, and I remember one trip I went back, and it wasn't there, and I was just really bummed. Um, and no one could say whatever happened to it just disappeared. That's not a very magical story, and that's actually <laughs> kind of sad. Yeah, it was. Uh, I still miss it. In fact, I've tried to buy another one on eBay. It's like eight hundred bucks. It's like a rare bike at two speed so you shift it by pushing back on the pedal there's no lever so it was really a fast bike you could get going pretty quick and so are they just hard to find or are they i don't know what the other question would be there some things are hard to find but not very expensive these sound like they're hard to find and expensive now hard to find really hard to find an old schwinn two-speed so what scenario can you envision where you would have the opportunity to buy one that you would do it? What is your price ceiling? <laughs> Somebody's going to watch this, some GI member, and they're going to say, I saw one of those down the street and I can get it for Tim. What are you willing to pay? Uh, just call me. Just let, let me know. Uh, because a lot of them on eBay, they're, they're just They've been ridden hard, you know, they've been hard, <laughs> hard miles on them. So, you know, the rim's only bent a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, a two-speed then, I mean, how how did that do on hills? It couldn't have been that great, right? Or oh, it's it was great because, you know, if you have a five-speed or a ten-speed, you have to sit down, change gears, and it doesn't really shift really cleanly. Whereas a two-speed, you just push it back like you were going to put the brakes on, shifts the gear, and the low gear was really easy. Oh, I rode it on off-road, on-road, anywhere. All right, we're going to find you one of these. So we had three, three questions left. One is another hazards question, and the, something that intrigued me when I started putting these together is what your opinion is on the most silent hazard facing North America today, and what should be done to raise awareness of that? Okay, silent hazard. So I'd say the silent hazard is the finite supply of fossil fuels. Now, I, I'm sure that sounds crazy, but silent because right now you see a, are hearing a lot about climate and climate change and climate and so on. But if, if you really think about it, or at least I see it as the underlying problem is fossil fuels and the limited resource, because now we're having to use hydraulic fracturing, we're having to talk about drilling in the Arctic. Offshore, of course, we go deeper and farther. 
offshore, and of course, we've had problems offshore. So if we would recognize that that's a finite source and move to green or renewable energies, just say, you know, we're, we're sort of, we've tapped the easy spots. So let's look at wind, solar, hydro. And if we do that, I think certainly it'd be better for the environment uh, using a lot of renewables. And that'll also help with the climate issues that we're talking about now. So what do you say to the people that it's fundamentally that say that it's fundamentally a technology issue and that, you know, we're drilling offshore 1.8 miles down and that's what we can do right now. But if only we could get two and a half miles down or if we could spider out another half mile, we'd have you know access to another field. What's your response to those people? Let's just call it two miles deep. OK, in water, two miles deep in water versus putting up a wind generator. That's a pretty solid case right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and two miles deep, if just call it that, and putting out some solar panels. And that, that's where, where I think if we focus the discussion on, you know, we've, we've tapped a lot of the easy sources. And geology, it's really hard to get a hydrocarbon reservoir, you know, you need a cap rock right. and trap and it's got to all come together at one point and there's just not many of those and plus over geologic time, it takes a long time to create one of those. So it's really kind of a limited resource. So let's start looking at some alternatives and obviously wind, solar, hydro, are really easy compared to two miles deep offshore. And again, that'll help us also with the climate environment situation because we'll be generating electrical power, for example, with non-carbon generating sources. That is great. That is a good, solid rebuttal for everybody watching here. So we have one more fun question for you. You've been at the University of Illinois for quite a while now. Who is the best, not necessarily your favorite, but the best Illini athlete that you have seen during your time there? Oh, oh, okay. Well, first, I got to narrow down to basketball. Kind of a enthusiast, basketball enthusiast. Jeff George, if you're watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> Among others, <laughs> uh, you know, Dick, yeah, well, Dick Buck was, was before me, but of course, um, Simeon Rice and some of the others. But so I'm going to narrow down to basketball. And with basketball, of course, you have to think of the 2005 team, especially given our early exit this year. Uh, I had I had high hopes that we were going to rerun 2005 this year, but we didn't. So in 2005, the I think the best athlete or player there was Darren Williams, D. Will. And for the viewers that haven't seen the three point shot he hit to send the game into overtime, to beat Arizona, it's it's a great shot, incredible. Um, and of course, he went on to a distinguished NBA career after that. So I'd say Darren Williams. Now, there's a special shout out on the 2005 team to a player, and I know, Brad, you follow sports. See if you know this person, Jack Ingram. I know the name. I was hoping it was going to be Luther Head because he was my favorite. But oh. <laughs> Luther was great, and, and of course, D. Brown was great. But uh, Jack was special because he was a integral part of the 2005 team, probably the sixth or seventh person, and he played front court. Very impactful player. But in his spare time. He was also majoring in electrical engineering. So that that was always impressive to me that he could juggle all that and 
go to the final four and and actually the championship game and keep all that together in 2005. So shout out to Jack. I always like it when they do the profiles of the students uh, that are in the competitions, whatever sport it is. And you look at the major and you see something other than general studies or (laughs) sports communications or something like that. It doesn't matter whether it's electrical engineering, whether it's international relations, whether it's bio or anything. It's it's just cool to see that because that's that's super impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And so the the other great thing about Jack is. Arizona inbounded the ball. It was Jack's deflection. And I think Luther picked up the loose loose ball. He threw it to Darren, and Darren was drained the three. So Jack set it all in motion, which was just great. So he was on the floor at the right time and got it done. It's a great season, and as a fan of the Big Ten, I'm hoping that uh, the Illini get deep in the tournament again soon. Not deeper than the Wolverines, but deep into the (laughs) tournament. (laughs) So our final question on Director's Cut today is you are a co-chair of the Geo Extreme Conference, which GI is holding in November from the 7th to 10th in Savannah. And yes, you are asking, it will be an in-person conference. (laughs) Tim, why should people attend Geo Extreme? Oh, this is great, Brad. So first, I'd like to acknowledge my co-chair, Farshid Vahedifard, at Michigan State University. Mississippi and, State University. Yeah, what did I say? Michigan. I said Michigan? Did I really? Oh, man. It's all right. They're both MSU. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry, Farshid. <laughs> it is MSU, right. Big 10 on the mind. Okay, so it, it's really great because... It is going to be the first and only in-person conference, GI conference, this year, 2021, coming out of a global pandemic. So I'm really looking forward to it. Second, it is the first Embankment Dams and Slopes specialty conference. The EDS committee has, in the past, focused on large conferences, and generally they're every 25 years. So The first was in 1966 at the University of California, Berkeley. They re-ran it in 1992 at Berkeley. And then the last big EDS Slope Stability Conference was in San Diego in 2013. So about every 25 years, the the committee mobilized a, a big conference. But I sort of looked around the committee and 25 years from now, a number of the senior members, <laughs> that's 2038, wouldn't wouldn't be attending the conference. And so I thought, how, how can we sort of keep people engaged over a shorter period of time than 25 years? <laughs> and so we came up with a specialty conference idea. So this is our very first specialty conference. And we thought we'd have a specialty conference every eight years, so eight 16, 24, which is close enough to 25. And so our our first is Geo Extreme 2021. And the thought there was these extreme events, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, wildfires, and the aftermath of wildfires like the Rat Creek landslide along Highway 1 right now, are slope stability related and related to embankment dams and slopes. So we proposed the specialty conference and luckily the GI awarded us a specialty conference. So we have 134 technical papers accepted. We have 10 plenary plenary speakers. And so we'll have two plenary speakers in the morning, two in the afternoon. And Those will be surrounded by concurrent technical sessions and a poster session where these 134 papers will be presented. The exhibitors and sponsors are really doing well already, so we're going to have a lively exhibit hall. So I hope people are looking forward to that. Another neat event that we're planning is an outreach event with some high schools, local high schools. And Missy Setz is helping to set that up 
with the Outreach and Engagement Committee. So we're excited about having that. Uh, I forgot to mention some of the sessions. So because this is a multidisciplinary specialty conference, we have a wide range of plenary speakers and session topics. So here are a couple session topics. Of course, case histories from hurricanes and other extreme events. So my St. Martin paper will be in one of those sessions. Climate modeling, climate, climate ab adaptation, risk management with extreme events, compound and cascading hazards. So compound extreme events such as a hurricane and an associated flood such as Hurricane Florence. Earthquakes, coastal su sustainability, which works really nicely for Savannah, Georgia and our venue. And then most importantly, Brad, November, the week of November 7th, it's the Savannah Wine and Food Festival all week long. So after the conference every day, we can go out and enjoy some Southern has hospitality, some Southern cuisine, and have a good time in Savannah, Georgia. That is excellent. Registration will open later this spring. As Tim mentioned, exhibits and sponsorships are already available. You can get those at geo-extreme.org or give us a call at GI headquarters in Reston, Virginia, and we are happy to help you out. So Tim, you made it through all the director's cut questions. You did a great job. I think we had a good time today. Absolutely. If you liked what you saw, again, click that subscribe button, click get notifications. And again, we will let you know every last time you might even think you're getting too many notifications every time we post a video to the YouTube channel. This is our last director's cut of March. We will see everyone in April. Thanks again, Tim, for being with us today. Brad, thanks for having me on director's cut. And we will see everyone soon. What, what are you picking for your for your event that signals the start of spring? Oh, uh, weather app and consistent 40s. Oh, that's pretty solid. 40s. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> when, when I get, you know, it's usually like January or late February, you know, you're just dying for spring. If I can pull up the weather app, scroll all 40s as far Wait, as I Wait, you mean highs? Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, man. This is Illinois. <laughs> wow.